Now, to me, the interesting thing is that people are attracted to someone with a different temperament because we see in them strengths that we do not have ourselves. Makes sense. And then after we get married, <laughs> then we discover their weaknesses. In this video, we're going to talk about marrying a different temperament than what you are. That's right. In fact, most people do. Yes, all of us. And that's what makes life interesting, isn't it? Absolutely. So with me today is Dr. Arnold Moore. And Dr. Moore is the person behind the whole questionnaire for LOFS and helping me develop LOFS for marriage capsule. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. But the one thing that I really learned out of this whole process is that we are made in a certain way. And that God created us for a certain purpose. Absolutely. And there's a reason that we function and think the way we do. Now, to me, the interesting thing is that people are attracted to someone with a different temperament because we see in them strengths that we do not have ourselves. Makes sense. And then after we get married, <laughs> then we discover their weaknesses. You know, I was very attracted to my wife because she has this loving, she's she is snow. She has this loving, compassionate, caring, just nature. It's just beautiful. You understand? She was attracted to me because I'm confident and decisive, can make my decisions. So you're an ocean. I'm an ocean. And then I discovered after we got married that she is terribly indecisive. <laughs> you understand? And so doing shopping together was, was a nightmare. So how did you do it? Well. We, we came to realize that every couple, and I've come to realize this since in many years, every couple actually makes a decision. Most of the couples do it subconsciously. You either concentrate on one another's strengths by pointing out things that you like, that you appreciate, that you value, or you focus on one another's shortcomings, always finding fault, criticizing, trying to change the other person. And you know, we change that. My wife and I, Joy and I, we've been married over 50 years now. We have, I would say for the last 43 years, focused on each other's strengths. We focus on telling each other what we like, what we appreciate about each other. And you know what? The shortcomings just become unimportant. She's still indecisive. You understand? But as a team, we work well together. I'm still not nearly as caring as she is. But those things don't matter to each other anymore. The scary part is when you focus on each other's shortcomings, you get to a point where you see nothing good in your partner. Mm. This was the love of your life, and you see nothing good in them. And it's, it's a choice that every couple make. Mm. As I say, most of them subconsciously. We made it consciously because we, we were Focusing aware of streets. what the dangers were of always mm. knocking each other's shortcomings because they're always there. But Arnold, today you're going to help us understand how to do life with your partner. Okay. So we're going to kick off with doing life with a fountain. Okay, now you know the fountain is the fun temperament. Yes. They, they, they talk a lot, they're jovial, they, uh, they're just the life of the party. But they are impulsive, they don't keep their promises, they, they talk too much, you know, things like that. So what's the best way? to cope with them. And I want to make a couple of suggestions. I think if you're married to a fountain, you've got to organize your spouse a great deal. And by organize, I mean just remind them about things. Okay. Um, write them little notes. Give them reminders. Um, tell them about time. Uh, for example, uh, if we have to leave at 10.30, I tell my spouse that we have to leave at quarter past 10. So then they'll be ready. And she really tries to be ready by quarter past ten, but you know fountains <laughs> and their time concept is very poor. So she might be ready by twenty-five past ten. But then you're in time. And we're still in time. And we don't have this uh and this aggro and this anger and this upset. Then you just don't expect them to be on time, just take it into account and that's how you manage them. Okay. The second thing, they need lots of approval, lots of encouragement, because the deepest need of a fountain is please like me. Please tell me that you approve of what I do. And so you have to give them and express it verbally. Lots of encouragement, lots of approval, 
Um, I mean, they need to hear regularly that you enjoy being with them, mm. that you enjoy their company. And then... Makes a lot of sense. Is that a daily thing that regular... Uh, uh, almost a daily <laughs> thing, yes. And then when you have discussions, and especially when you're discussing some serious matters, you've got to pin them down. Because, you know, fountains talk a lot without saying anything. And they go in circles and they talk and they talk and they talk. The, the other day I, I counseled a lady who was a fountain and she took me two hours to tell her what's going on in her life. And she could have done it in 10 minutes in terms of what she wanted to come and see me about. But she just wanted to go on and, and eventually I just said, no, hang on, stop it. What are you asking me? Why have you come to... You, know, you have to just simply pin them down to what they're thinking. Um, and then, just expect them to have fluctuating moods. Now one time, you come in there and they're so happy to see you, and the next one they go, and they're in the pits and they're miserable. You understand? And you need to accept that. And don't say, oh, pull yourself together or something like that. That's the way they are. Um, Give them some words of encouragement. Yes, expect fountains to change your minds frequently. And don't be upset about it. You say, well, that's the way it is. And, and if they don't, they make promises. Fountains often make promises, but they don't think ahead. And they mean it at the time, but then they forget afterwards. Don't get upset with it. Just accept it. That's the way a fountain is. Oh, that's awesome. So if you're a fountain or married to a fountain, I'm sure that you wrote these tips down. So the next one we're going to do is I marry an ocean. Oh, God. <laughs> what do you do now? That's the same temperament as I am. Now, now, the ocean is what we call the strong temperament. They are decisive, they're confident, they're just natural leaders, they're, they're extremely active, but they've got some serious shortcomings. They tend to be unsympathetic, uncaring, um, they ride roughshod over people's feelings because they just want to get their, their goals achieved and things like that. So, what's the best way to deal with an ocean? Well, first of all, you need to try and use logical arguments when you reason with them. Never go to an ocean and say, but I feel this way, <laughs> or I feel we should do this, because that doesn't count for him. He says, give me the pros, give me the cons, you know, just, just be logical with them. Um, and, and they don't relate well with people who go by their feelings. I mean, I know of a guy, he'll say to his wife, Listen, do you feel like going to the movies tonight? And she'll say, well, let's wait and see how we feel. And he says, what's feeling got to do with it? You either decide we go or we don't go, you know. It's that sort of thing. Um, and oceans, more than any other temperament, want to be admired for their accomplishments. You've got to tell them regularly how you admire what they've achieved, how you compliment of what they've done, how in awe you stand of them. Because that, that, they like little... Boys and girls who just want to be, you know, told how great they are. Mm. And, and just do it. But do it in a matter-of-fact manner. D don't be all gushy. Oh, you're so wonderful. So, no, you know, wow, I'm impressed with what you did. You know, or, wow, I really like what you did there. Or, sure, you did that well. You know, this sort of matter-of-fact. So it's a very specific compliment. It's yes. not a general one. No, 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 no. Acknowledging a book that you've written. No, or no, no, yeah. Something specific. Yeah. Say, so, wow, look at this book you've written and, and the cover, it's a terrific cover, or, you know, or, uh, you know, I mean, my wife said to me the other day, uh, she said, wow, the way you fixed that, that thing in our house, I can't even remember what it was, she says, oh, you did that well, I'm very, I'm very <laughs> impressed with you, you know, that you were able to fix that. And you were like, yeah. oh, great, uh, that, that's what Ocean's want. Okay, so they really like that. So what are we going to do next, the snow? No, 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 hang on. Oh, we still have things with Ocean. You need to ignore their cold and abrupt manner okay. they, because they are so focused on their goal and what they're busy with that they forget about the niceties. You know, I will pick up the phone and somebody answers and I say, uh, Lisa Lovett, and then you'll say, how are you? Oh, oh no, no, I'm fine. How are you? No, okay. Now, now, Lisa, can we, do you understand? They, they, they're not concerned about the how are you, are you okay, and that sort of thing. They're busy, so they tend to be abrupt. You know, get on with it. For them, yeah. uh, a, a telephone conversation is to achieve a goal, not not an experience yes. for uh, you know mm. for socialising. And and they can be very forthright. O oceans more than any other temperament say what's on their minds. Okay. You know, and it, it it can be hurtful sometimes, but the advantage is 
you can always be sure that they mean what they say. Mm. They don't have hidden agendas. Yeah, I was just going to say. Okay, there's so no subtleties. What you see and what you hear. They don't hint thing. at things like that. Do you understand? <laughs> what they want, they say. And you exactly. know, yeah. And you've got to take them at their word. And the trouble is, they are inclined to take you at your word. Mm. When you say, well, um, my wife and I will discuss something, and I say, okay, can we decide to do that? We'll, we'll, we'll go. Uh, and she'll say, yeah. And then a week later, I say, well, I've made the bookings or we're going there. She says, but we haven't decided yet. I said, but we did. You mm -hmm. said. <laughs> you understand? And, and oceans are like that, babe. It's completed. It's, it's very, very mat matter of fact. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we get to the snow temperament. Okay, so now if you're married to a snow, take note. Now remember, the snows are the gift of people. Yes. They, they uh, absolutely talented, they're sensitive, they're loving, they're compassionate, they, they're just wonderful people. I'm married to one. But they're indecisive. Still very much in love, you can see. <laughs> indecisive, they're the perfectionist, you know, the, the, and the perfectionist isn't someone who wants to do something well. It's after they've done something well, they feel it should have been done better. They're never quite satisfied, you know, and they get very moody, very touchy, things like that. Okay, so what's the best way to approach a, uh, a, a sorry, a snow spouse, right? Well, you need to encourage and reassure them often because they, their perfectionism, they always feel they're not good enough. And they have more than any other temperament a tremendous amount of self-doubt. And it's a burden to them. Mm. So you need to tell them regularly how terrific they are, how well they've done, uh, reassure them they're on the right track. Um, for an ocean, you need to give them 10 words of criticism to counteract one compliment. Other way around. Ten for the ocean. Oh, for the, for, oh, for for the, the ocean. ocean. But 10 criticisms for one compliment. Correct. But for the snow, you need to give them 10 compliments to counteract one criticism. Wow. Because they take the criticism very personally and it really affects them and they're inclined to ignore or brush off the compliments. So you've got to oh, give them lots of wow. compliments. Okay. You understand? Whereas the ocean brushes off the criticisms so but then hangs on to the, yes. to the compliments. Yes. Yeah, so that's one of the things. And then when it comes to uh, snow spouses, you need to guess what they expect you to do for them. Because they won't ask you. I mean, one of the biggest sources of conflict that my wife and I had was that she wants me to help around the house, which I would willingly do, except she wants me to help without her asking me. <laughs> and my mind is not set to that, do you understand? And then, because, then she gets all angry and upset because I didn't help her. And then, or, or, or when I suddenly think, oh, do you need some help? Well, it's too late now. And I say, well, why didn't you ask me? No, you must see that I, you know, they just expect you to see that you need their help. And, and don't wait for them to ask for help because they'll just do it themselves and then they're angry with you for not helping Yeah. And then they tend to be more pessimistic than any other temperament and just accept that. Um, they're inclined to see only the problems. And when they do, then, the best way to say, yeah, oh, no, you're right, yes, no, I can see that might be a... Just don't, don't try and talk them out of it because that makes them worse. Oh, you know? really? Yes, and when they're in the mood, don't say, what's wrong? Just accept it. Because if you say, man, you're in the mood again, then they get worse. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and and just, just accept their moods. Okay. Just accept their upsets, as I said, without saying anything and they may be inclined to take their frustrations out on you uh, if, if you're married to a snow and they're upset about something they'll get mad with you and they will not ask or apologize very easily okay when my wife does something and she knows she's wrong she doesn't tell me she's sorry she just becomes very sweet and loving to me <laughs> then i know okay that's her way of saying sorry and i accept that i don't insist that she that she, uh, you know, Say applies so. to that. Okay. Okay. So that's our snow. That's the snow. So lastly, we're going to talk about the lake. So I married a lake. How do uh, I do life? Well, lakes are these wonderful, easy-going people. They seldom get upset. They seldom get depressed. Of course, they seldom get excited. <laughs> you know? 
I heard the other day a wife says to her lake husband, we've won a trip to Mauritius. He said, that's nice. <laughs> you understand? He said, that they very controlled emotions, but they are slow. They tend to put things off. They, they don't express themselves. They understand? They, they, yes. they, they, they're more introverted and they keep quiet. Now, how do you deal with a, uh, a lake spouse? And the best way is, well, first of all, whenever you have discussions and there are differences of opinion, draw them out. In a, in a discussion, for instance, when you have some friends for dinner, there'll be discussion, the lake will be very quiet. Mm. And you've actually got to say to the lake, so what do you think about this? Mm. Oh, no, yeah. no, no, but tell us what you, you... You actually have to keep drawing them out. Otherwise, they won't say anything. You know? Because, remember for a lake, they want to avoid conflict at all costs. Okay. And that's why they are very reluctant to express how they feel or what they think in case somebody disagrees with them and it may bring about some conflict so to avoid that conflict they will not say anything it's important to draw them out and you need to push them to make decisions because they will put it off and they'll put it off and they'll put it off and then we I remember counseling a couple where the husband was a lake and she would ask him to do things around the house and he would say yes you do it but he never gets around to it you understand and it was very frustrating and it was a great source of conflict for them so what they agreed was that, uh, will you be able to fix this broken tap or whatever? He'd say, yes. She says, okay, what, what is the deadline? By when will you do it? They, and they agreed that, okay. okay. And so she would put a note on the fridge, fix tap by next week Thursday or you know, whatever. And the agreement was that if he doesn't do it by that date, she can call in a handyman and do it and he would have to pay for that. Oh fantastic. Do you understand? Right. And of course he didn't want somebody else to come and do it and, and that's how they, they resolved that issue. That's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, so um, because if given the option, you know, lakes will hope the problem goes away or solves itself, you know, the tap will start working by itself or whatever they, <laughs> they, they do. And, and you need to be very patient with their procrastination and indecisiveness. Mm. That, that, they put things off because they're so scared if they make a decision, you won't like it, and it leads to conflict. Mm. And you understand? And, and they want to avoid conflict at all costs. It's, it's really an emotional strain for them to commit themselves to anything new. Okay. Once the lake has committed himself or herself to a particular responsibility, they're the salt of the earth. They're the most dependable temperament there is. But to get them to do that far, you know, when there's a problem in the community, the ocean will say, let's do something mm -hmm. about it. The lake will say, why doesn't somebody do, do something okay. about it? Right. You understand? But they, they, um, and, and uh, I remember, I have, uh, I have uh, some family members who are strong. It's actually two brothers-in-law who are strong lakes. And they have asked me not to wish them a happy birthday. And of course, I want to know, well, why not? Because they said, well, because then we have to remember yours. <laughs> and it's just too much effort. It's just too much strain. Another lake husband says to me, he loves it when he's gardening. And lakes, lake men love to garden. And my wife comes and sits there, but she mustn't talk to me. She must just be there. Just be there. Yes, they, they love the silent companionship. And so accept that and don't try and engage them in conversations that force them to think because then they get annoyed and irritated and they get up and walk out. Um, you just need to accept their lack of communication and feedback. That, just accept it because lakes are inclined to think it, not say it. No? So when I do all these things, so like I have to now get my mind I'm married a lake, so this is what I do. I'm married an ocean, this is what I do. So I focus on these strengths and how I can be a good partner to them. What yes. happens in our marriage? You begin to appreciate one another because remember this, they won't change. Mm. Your spouse is not going to change. And all you end up is a war zone, which eventually leads to divorce. Mm. And then you marry somebody else. And you either marry somebody with the same temperament, that, that is the most common occurrence, but if you marry somebody with a different temperament, you've swapped one set of shortcomings for another set of shortcomings. Mm -hmm. So, enjoy what you have. Enjoy the positives. And enjoy one another. And just accept that they have shortcomings like you have. Oh, that's awesome.
I hope you enjoyed these practical tips. We'll leave them down below for you to cross-reference, but make sure that you make it part of your daily life. Thank you, Arnold. Okay, you're welcome. Focus on each other's shortcomings. You get to a point where you see nothing good in your partner. Mm.